the word with you. Yes, yes, it's been quite a uh, torrid year for my wife and I, and I'm still not out of the woods with uh, with my back pain and uh, just waiting on the surgeon to tell me if he thinks he can help me by having another go at it. But anyway, we just have to um, carry on and uh, with the Lord's help and his goodness, we continue from day to day. So my desire tonight is to uh, share some thoughts with you on the grace of God. Uh, we'll read together 1 Peter chapter 5 and uh, the 14 verses. My reason for taking this subject tonight is that um, I was uh, reading through this part of the word and my mind went back to many, many years ago, probably about 50 years when I was in my early 30s, a dear brother, a minister of the word, paid us a visit and he spoke on chapter five and the background of his message was this. He said he believed that Peter was sharing how the grace of God was so manifest in his life as he had um, journeyed with the Lord and the lessons that he had learned. And now he was willing to share those with the believers and those scattered areas who were facing some trials and difficulties, persecution for their newfound faith in the Lord. So I'd like to read to you first um, Peter chapter five and the whole chapter. The elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, and nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you, to him be the glory and the dominion for ever and ever. Amen. And we trust the Lord will bless to us this reading of this chapter of his word tonight. I want to think of the God of all grace that Peter um, expresses to us here in this chapter, thinking of him as the, both the source and the resource of grace. Something's happening. Peter writes, may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen and settle you. Peter also states that his purpose in writing the letter is to encourage them and to assure them that what they were experiencing is truly part of God's grace for them, so stand firm in it. God's grace features large in the New Testament writings. John tells us that when the Lord Jesus came into the world, he brought an abundance of grace. John 1.16 says, of his fullness, we have all received and grace upon grace. Or we could say one gracious blessing after another. 
Just as an aside, a woman asked some guests for dinner, and when it was served, she asked her child to say grace. But, Mummy, I don't know what to say, the child said. Just say what Mummy said. So the child smiled, she bowed her head, and she said, Dear God, why did I invite all these people? We smile, but that's not the grace we're talking about. But you can understand how giving thanks for food became known as saying grace because it is an acknowledgement of God's gracious provision in giving us food to eat. So we ask, what is grace? So I looked up the dictionary, and the dictionary says it's the unmerited love and favor of God toward human beings, or the divine enabling given to a person to make them pure and morally strong. But the, let's think of the Bible meaning the Greek word is charis, and it comes to us really in two parts. Firstly, the unmerited favor to guilty sinners. And we know the verse well, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. But it is also freely supplied help for needy saints. And so we have the encouragement, let us come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So grace is truly kindness that we don't deserve. There is nothing that we have done or can do to earn this favor. It is a gift from God. This grace that we're thinking of is truly amazing because it not only provides for our salvation, but it enables us to live an abundant life in Jesus Christ. And Paul wrote, God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. God's grace is available to us at all times for every problem and every need that we face. And we think of grace, it's a major Bible subject, evident from the very beginning, when God graciously provided a covering for Adam and Eve, when they fell for Satan's lies. And we read that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord and was saved in the ark when God judged wicked humanity, when they were all drowned in the flood. And God declared to Moses in the wilderness that he was merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. And David in the Psalm 103 declared, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. In the New Testament, most of the pastoral letters begin with grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And they conclude with, may grace be with you all. Paul thanked God for grace at work in the Corinthian believers. These verses read, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the Hebrew believers were encouraged to stand firm in God's grace. The writer says, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial foods, which is of no benefit to those who do so. We think about the attributes of grace, and we've already uh, had this verse before us, but we, we, we can say that grace saves. This is a wonderful, ver these are wonderful verses that are given to us by Paul in Ephesians chapter 2. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, has made us alive together with Christ. 
by grace you have been saved, and has raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. What an amazing uh, portion of scripture this is for us, to think that what the grace of God has made available to us, made us alive together with Christ. And then we've been raised up together, and we are made to sit together in the heavenly places. It's hard for us to really comprehend the amazing reality of what these statements actually say, that this is how we are seen by God, before God, united together with Christ uh, in the heavenly realm. While we're still here on earth, yet this is our privileged position. This is our standing before God. And that it is going to have a tremendous impact for the ages to come. That God is going to be able to reveal the riches of his grace throughout all eternity to the angelic hosts of how God's grace has reached out to unworthy uh, fallen humanity who have come by faith to accept this wonderful offer of salvation. What a tremendous concept for us to rejoice in as we think of what God's grace has done for us in saving our soul. But then Paul wrote of the fact of how grace strengthens us for our Christian journey. He said, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. You can see I've abbreviated uh, the long portion. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul responds, therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For when I am weak, then I am strong. What a tremendous uh, concept is presented to us here, how that in the difficulties and uh, the things that come across us in our pathway, we may wonder why and uh, we would like to be free from them. But God in his wondrous grace and his mercy towards us allows us to go through these things so that we may really understand and appreciate that God's grace, his ability to enable us to withstand and to endure is sufficient to keep us going. What a tremendous um, commendation we have from the Apostle Paul in the, these verses. Then we think of what we've already indicated, grace enables. Paul looked at his life and looked at what he was uh, before he um, became a believer, what a persecutor he was. He's, uh, as he wrote to Timothy, he said he was an insolent man. Um, he was determined to stamp out anything uh, to do with Jesus Christ and his followers. But he said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. And so Paul uh, attributed it to God's abundant grace towards him that had transformed his life from what he once was to what he now was as a true believer and faithful servant of the risen Christ. And then Paul also writes to Titus and tells us, tells him that grace also teaches us. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness 
and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. What a wonderful concept for us to consider as we think of these tremendous words in this verse. We live in a very uh, dark age. Uh, there are many things that uh, stress us as believing people, and uh, but there is uh, sufficiency resources available to us through the grace of God to be able to live lives that are totally different from the godless world around about us. And so we say no to ungodliness and the world and its lusts, and we live soberly righteously and godly in this present age and then the great hope that's set before us and what a great hope this is as we consider where we are at what an amazing prospect lies before us the return the glorious appearing and the blessed hope of the believer the return of our lord jesus christ so god's grace enables us to live in a way that will bring honor and glory to our God and our Savior. So we can say that God's grace frees us from the slavery to sin, our guilt and shame, and enables us to be all that God intends us to be. So our conclusion is that grace is not only God's unmerited favor in our salvation, but it's also God's enabling gift for living the Christian life here for our Lord and Saviour. So now coming to focusing on the chapter, sort of an overview, I thought that we could take from scripture of how grace is presented to us. But coming to Peter's letter, Peter begins the letter in chapter one by praying that God's grace would be multiplied to them. Also that God's grace is promised to them. He said the prophets inquired and they searched carefully of the grace that would come to you. And then he wrote that God's grace for service is manifold. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Peter writes to the believers to encourage them to stand strong during the trials and difficulties they were facing. He agrees with Paul, who wrote, this standing in grace will involve trials and will need perseverance, but that will also produce character and give us hope in God's coming glory. As we read in Romans 5, those first uh, verses 2 to 4. It isn't easy to remain strong when the future looks bleak, when the devil assails our faith and when persecution is fierce. Peter writes from his own experiences in life how God's grace comforted, restored, and strengthened him in his own weaknesses. Sharing our own experiences of God's enabling grace in our lives can be an encouragement to other believers. So let's see how Peter shared his experience of God's enabling grace in this chapter five. Peter as an elder. He said, the elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being exam examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. This takes us to Peter's experience with the Lord in John 21. We read these words from that portion of scripture. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. 
he said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and you walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spake, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. The Lord had directed the disciples to go to Galilee and to wait for him there. A verse in Matthew 28 and 10 says, Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Jesus had called Peter to be a fisher of men, but he decided to go back to his old fishing occupation. And so that night they had a fruitless night of fishing. But after obeying a stranger's command to place the net on the right side of the boat, and then after having amazing success, Peter suddenly realized it must be the Lord. So he plunged into the sea and he hurried to the shore. And there he found that the Lord had graciously prepared breakfast for them. Peter may have felt some shame in not waiting for the Lord and going back to fishing. But here he experienced God's restoring grace, grace and commission to be a shepherd and elder of the Lord's flock, both the lambs and the sheep, the young and the old. And he would be graciously enabled to suffer martyrdom for his faith. Peter felt unworthy, but out of devotion to his Lord, he had obeyed this command. And now he was encouraging the elders that God would graciously enable them to do what God had called them to do, not as dictators, nor for financial gain, but willingly and exemplary in expectation of the crown of glory from the chief shepherd. Although Peter directed these words to the elders, I believe they have a great message that declares that God's grace is available it is for all believers and then in verses five to six peter's humility likewise you younger people submit yourselves to your elders yes all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility for god resists the proud but he gives grace to the humble therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of god that he may exalt you in due time Peter encouraged all the believers to be humble and submissive to one another. The Lord graciously taught the disciples how to be humble in submitting and serving one another. We go to John chapter 13 and the experience that Peter had learning something about what true humility is. Jesus rose from supper and he laid aside his garments. He took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, 
His servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. It seems Peter had quite an ego. He was often at the forefront of many events. Once, when the disciples were disputing who would be the greatest, the Lord placed a little child in their midst and rebuked them with the example of its lowliness. What was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? But they kept silent, for on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. And he, Jesus, sat down, he called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Peter says, be clothed with humility. I believe Peter never forgot that lesson that he learned at the Last Supper when Jesus clothed himself with a towel and he washed the disciples' feet. None of the disciples were willing to do the lowly servant's task, which was the usual um, cultural habit when they came to a person's place. And they had not done that. And Peter objected. He said to the Lord, you will never wash my feet. But the Lord showed him he must be washed to fellowship with him. And Jesus said, I have given you an example. Now do as I have done to you. And even Jesus had even washed Judas, the traitor's feet. So I believe Peter learned a great lesson on humility that day. And as an elder, he showed his humility. He was one among them, not as a dictator over the believers. And he encourages every believer that there is grace for us to be humble in our minds and in our actions with one another. And then in verse 7, Peter speaks about anxiety, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for, or as some translations have about you. Peter had some very anxious experiences, especially with violent storms on the lake and how Jesus had calmed their fears. There was one storm in particular that Peter would never forget, as recorded in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14. They were caught in a storm. And in the fourth watch of the night, between approximately 3 and 6 a.m. in the morning, they thought they saw a ghost walking on the water, and they were terrified. But Jesus called out, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter calls, Lord, if it's you, let me come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, and he walks to Jesus. But seeing the storm, fear gripped him, and he began to sink. And Peter cries out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus saved him. Amazing thing for us to think that, you know, Peter, with all his boastfulness and his uh, uh, forthrightness, the Lord never just said, well, Peter, you know, I can't help you. You've chosen to do this. But no, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ was so wonderful in Peter's experience that immediately Jesus reached out and saved him. Peter had great faith in stepping out of the boat, but the storm terrified him. The Lord didn't let him drown, but his gracious hand saved him. Peter never forgot that day when he proved God's grace in saving him. Peter was affirming Paul's words, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And then in verses 8 and 9, we read, Peter speaks of trials. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is seeking to devour you. Peter knew the bitter experience of being attacked by the devil. We remember the Lord told Peter that Satan was out to get him. But the Lord said, I have prayed for you that your faith 
should not fail. We remember that Peter had promised he would never deny the Lord. In fact, he said he was willing to either go to prison or to even die for the Lord, as recorded in Luke 22. But when the pressure came on, Peter failed and had denied his Lord three times. We remember that in the garden he went to sleep when the Lord asked him to watch with me. And then when the um, betrayers came, he lashed out with the sword. In the courtyard, he denied the Lord three times, and he went away weeping bitterly at his failure. The adversary, the devil, had captured Peter, and he failed his Lord. What wondrous grace the Lord showed Peter in his restoration that we read of in John chapter 21. And the Lord had said to Peter, when you are converted, strengthen the believers. Peter warns us that there is an adversary that is against us and we need to be self-controlled and wide awake. I thought of it this way. Peter says, your adversary. And he's speaking, of course, of these different um, ways in which the enemy works against us. But I just thought of him as the adversary. That's opposition. And there's much of that that comes against us in our lives as believers. And then Peter identifies, he says, the devil, and that name devil really means the accuser, the accusing one. So that's accusation. And then he's walking about, that's observation. The devil is always on our track. And then like a roaring lion, that's intimidation. And what is his end goal? Seeking to devour. That's ruination. And so Peter says that he had experienced in his own life something of these facets of the enemy's attack against us, against him. And he shares with us the reality of how we can overcome. We can't afford to be lax. We must resist the evil one by being steadfast in the faith. And Ephesians 6 and 10, where we read of the soldier's armor, we are encouraged to hold true to God's word using the sword of the spirit. Mm. And then there's Peter's suffering. Remember, others are suffering too, but only for a brief time, Peter writes in those verses. Peter reminds them that all around the world, believers were suffering for their faith in Christ. He reminds them that they are not alone in this spiritual warfare. Every believer experiences Satan's attacks. And as the scripture says, all who live godly will suffer persecution in some form. We remember how Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, the gospel for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer even to the point of chains, but the word of God is not chained. Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This is a faithful saying, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. God is forever true and faithful. And we can rest our whole lives on that. But we are called to, uh, would some have called this the martyr's hymn. And we do know that uh, Brother Peter, Brother Paul, and most of the apostles, they actually died the martyr's death. And so some believe that this is what Paul is referring to. If we die with him, we shall also live with him. But then if we endure, we shall also reign with him. And if we deny him, he will deny us. It doesn't mean that believers will not gain an entrance into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, but there will be a denial of the rewards that could have been ours if we had endured and not denied. So this is reward, not destiny. And Paul then 
uh, writes further to Timothy, but you have carefully followed my perseverance, the persecutions, the afflictions which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And as we read of believers in different parts of troubled, our troubled world today, there is much persecution for those who uh, name the name of Christ. And even in our own Western society, we are watching more and more of people who are taking a stand for truth being persecuted by the authorities. And um, it's just one of those things that we can see there as the um, society and the world becomes more godless, there is a great antagonism towards those who would follow biblical principle, who would seek to uh, name the name of Christ, who would stand for what is morally right and true, they are being very much persecuted in our day today. And so Peter remembers in verses 9 and 10 that others are suffering. I'm sorry, we went there. Peter was no stranger to suffering and was able to encourage these persecuted believers. He and John had been arrested, imprisoned, and threatened, but they refused to be silenced and they went on preaching, as we read in that account in Acts chapter 4. And then they were arrested again and imprisoned, but miraculously an angel opened the door and released them, and they continued to preach. The angry Jews attempted to kill them, but Gamaliel intervened. They were flogged, and they were commanded never again to preach the gospel, as recorded in Acts 5. But they chose to obey God rather than men, departing and continued preaching, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. And so it's important for us to understand God's purpose in suffering and its impact upon us that will redound for our eternal glory. And then in verses 10 to 11, Peter's words of encouragement, the God of all grace, who has called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, perfect, establish, strengthen and settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We would say this is truly grace abounding. Peter's experiences of God's grace towards him show he was well able to encourage the believer. He assured them that the God of all grace would supply them with everything they needed to stand strong in their faith. And he concludes with these encouraging words that we have been called to eternal glory. This is a great prospect for us. We have been called to a glorious future. Every believer has this calling that we are going to share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a great prospect lies ahead of us. And then Peter reminds them that the suffering is ju just brief. It is fleeting temporary in comparison to eternal glory and those wonderful verses that the apostle paul wrote in chapter 8 of romans where he said that it's nothing to be compared our sufferings are nothing to be compared with the glory that will be revealed to us when we reach our heavenly home so god's grace is able to perfect peter said the word means to make us mature to allow God to be able to complete his purpose in us, why he called us and what he plans for our lives as we are left here. And then Peter says he will establish you. That means to fi firm, firmly fix, to make us secure in our faith and for our future. In the midst of the vicissitudes of life, the different experiences that we all have, some may tend to shake us, but Peter says the grace of God, the God, the grace that comes from the God of all grace is able to firmly fix us so that we can stand secure in our faith.
And then he says to strengthen you. That means to make you strong, to enable us to be able to overcome, be resilient in the face of opposition and the enemy. And then to settle you means to lay a foundation, to be solidly grounded and unmovable. These are just um, four uh, very uh, great words that are uh, so encouraging for us as God's people, what God's grace is able to do for us in our lives as we are left here to serve our Lord and Savior, waiting for his return. And so I conclude with uh, these thoughts. And I'm sure you share with me as we reflect on what we've um, traveled over in these uh, amazing verses that we have read throughout the New Testament, that we would just say to God be all the glory. Great things he has done for us. And he is doing for us now and will yet do as we cast our minds forward beyond this life into the future. What great things God's grace has done. And we would conclude by saying amen and amen. We can't win in our own strength. But God is willing and able to help us. We have to call on him. And as the scripture says, nothing is impossible with God. And Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 8 and 31 that God is for us. So who can be against us? God's will will never lead us where God's grace can't sustain us. The circumstances these believers that Peter wrote to were in that they were encountering were all in the will of God. That's what Peter was encouraging them with. Don't be discouraged. Don't be put off. This is the true grace of God and stand firm in it. Be well grounded, be secure and persevere. And so these words uh, must have been a tremendous encouragement to these scattered believers as they read Peter's letter and the way he used his own experience of how God's grace had strengthened him, uh, ministered to him, enabled him in his uh, journey of faith and service after the Lord had gone back to glory and what he was called to do as the apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, so we can be encouraged by how Peter wrote of his own experiences to these believers. And I thought about the um, good old hymn that uh, we used to sing. Don't, don't sing it quite so much now, but the words are still so very true. Even although written in the 1700s, I understand that uh, Philip Doddridge was the author of verses one and three. And Augustus Toplady wrote the verses two, four and five. And so let's just think of those words again tonight. Grace, it is a charming sound, harmonious to the ear. Heaven with the echo shall resound and all the earth shall hear. It was grace that wrote my name, wrote your name in life's eternal book. It was grace that gave me to the Lamb who all my sorrows took. What a wonderful thought for us to think about what our Lord and Savior suffered to bring us into a place of forgiveness and cleansing. And then it's grace that taught our wandering feet to tread the heavenly road and new supplies each hour I meet while pressing on to God. And grace taught my soul to pray and made mine eyes o'erflow. It was, to, it was grace which has kept me to this day and grace will not let me go. So let this grace inspire my soul with strength divine. May all my powers to thee aspire and all my days be thine. And the chorus goes, saved by grace alone. This is all my plea. Jesus died for all mankind and Jesus died for me. I trust that this meditation tonight that I've had recently, reflecting on the message that that brother gave, you know, many, many years ago, and uh, just bringing it and uh, 
thinking about this chapter as I read it through recently in my reading and thinking what a tremendous God we have, a God of all grace. There is nothing that we can experience in our lives day by day that God's grace is not sufficient to enable us. His wonderful grace has saved us. His ongoing grace enables us. And it's throughout all eternity, God is going to display to the heavenly realm the wonder of his great grace towards undeserving sinners. May the Lord bless his word. And I hope that you're encouraged by thinking about God's wonderful grace in Christ Jesus towards us, his people. Thank you for listening. <clears throat> Thank you, Brother Jim, for sharing with us the word of encouragement this evening indeed. I wonder if our brother Norman will close the meeting in a word of prayer, after which the meeting will be over. And just a reminder, our brother Jim will be with us next week if the Lord has still not come. We look forward to our brother sharing with us next week. So brother Norman will close in prayer, after which the meeting will be over. Thank you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for so much that you've given us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. And we see that Peter realized the wonderfulness of the Lord and the grace he was shown. And then he, by example, shared with others through his letters. We thank you for the encouragement of uh, Peter's letters and uh, the practical uh, ministry that he gave to each one of us. And we thank you for the re record of Peter's letters for us to read ourselves and study. Thank you, Lord, for the blessing that we've had tonight. And we just ask, as uh, further lessons are prepared, Father, we ask for grace as well. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.